Good afternoon. Thank you for joining Mayor Brown's Global Financial Markets Teleconference Series. Today's call is one of our special edition COVID-19 update calls entitled COVID-19 Lessons for the Future of Debt Collection. My name is Deborah Bogo Ernst, and I am a partner in Mayor Brown's Chicago office. I co-lead Mayor Brown's Litigation and Dispute Resolution Practice in Chicago, and I co-lead the firm's nationwide consumer and class action practice. I represent national and multinational corporations in a wide range of business sectors with particular emphasis on the defense of commercial and consumer-based individual and class action litigation, as well as enforcement actions in the financial services and insurance industries. First, a couple of housekeeping items. As regular listeners will know, this call is being recorded. We will be emailing an audio link to all participants should you wish to listen to the teleconference again or forward it to your colleagues. In addition, the recording will also be available as a podcast on your preferred podcast platform. Since we will not have a Q&A session, please send your questions regarding today's topic by email to g, f as in Frank, m as in Mary, at mayorbrown.com, and we will respond promptly. This is the same email address on your invitation email. Joining me today are my colleagues, Eric Mitzenmacher and Anjali Garg. Eric is a partner in Mayor Brown's Washington, D.C. office and a member of the firm's Financial Services Regulatory and Enforcement Group. His practice involves providing regulatory compliance advice to companies that offer consumer and small business financial products and services, as well as conducting regulatory due diligence reviews on behalf of investors in and financing sources for such companies. Anjali is a senior associate in Mayor Brown's Washington, D.C. office and a member of the Financial Services Regulatory and Enforcement Group. She represents companies in connection with federal and state investigations regarding compliance with applicable servicing and debt collection rules, as well as other consumer financial protection laws. With those brief introductions, we will now begin today's discussion. Today, we will start with Eric. Eric will discuss how economic fallout from COVID-19 has affected debt collection requirements and proposals at the federal level. Following a summary of the pre-COVID collection regulatory regime, he will discuss how collection-related provisions enacted in the CARES Act or proposed in the HEROES Act would alter the landscape during, in the immediate wake of, and potentially after federally declared emergency. I will now turn the presentation over to Eric. Thank you, Deb. As noted, I will be speaking about federal debt collection regulatory developments resulting from the COVID-19 emergency. We will speak a bit about the regulatory changes that have been enacted, in particular as part of the CARES Act earlier this year. We will also speak a bit about broader proposals that have gained traction as part of the HEROES Act, which passed the House last month with a largely Democratic backing. The HEROES Act has been declared dead on arrival as a package by Senate Republicans and the President, but there still may be room for compromise on particular provisions as Congress considers another wave of COVID-19 relief stimulus. And certain aspects of the current proposals may provide a glimpse into Democratic priorities with respect to debt collection regulation going forward. Before we get to the proposal, I will provide some background on the relevant financial impacts of the COVID-19 emergency as well as the existing federal debt collection regulatory regime to which the proposals would make changes. It should not be controversial at this point to say that the COVID-19 emergency and resulting limitations in economic activity have placed tens of millions of Americans in relatively tenuous financial positions. Pre-COVID, approximately one in four Americans had essentially no rainy day fund and 60% of Americans did not have confidence that they could cover a $1,000 emergency need from savings or non-retirement investments. In that group, common sources of emergency funds include credit cards, HELOCs, and personal loans. So even pre-COVID, we were in a world in which relatively moderate emergencies could push individuals into increased debt loads. COVID-19 has now made that a national issue that has market-moving and policy-moving implications. 
At this point, the financial impact on any given individual or household during the early stages of the emergency has been ambiguous. Stimulus payments, enhanced unemployment, and voluntary pay increases from employers, including hazard pay in some cases, have pushed against the broader slowdown. As we progress into what looks to be an extended period of stage reopenings, however, temporary stimulus payments seem less likely than overall market effects to drive consumers' and businesses' exposure to increased debt loads. Certain emergency responses, including a set of collection-related and consumer protection-related items we will discuss, may also disincentivize payments that could otherwise have been made uh, in a timely manner by consumers, potentially artificially increasing debt loads. These include protections from adverse credit reporting, and in some cases, additional protections from adverse impacts of delinquency or default, such as eviction or repossession, that have been included to some degree in federal legislation and also pushed at the state level. Overall, there's always been a lot of debt in this country. Emergencies strain borrower resources and push more debt into past due or defaulted statuses. This emergency seems particularly likely to increase the number of Americans exposed to at least some degree of collection activity. These forces are pushing us toward a conversation about debt collection regulation, not just during the COVID-19 emergency, but for at least some time after, as the market works its way through debt that accumulates over the course of the emergency, and for some of the changes, potentially permanently, as the emergency provides political push necessary for advocates of broader debt collection reform to accomplish their longer-term objectives. To understand where we might go, you have to understand where we're starting from. With respect to collection-related requirements at the federal level, that largely means understanding the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, or FDCPA, and federal requirements related to unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices, or UDAP requirements. The FDCPA is the core federal law dealing specifically with requirements imposed on entities collecting debt. But it does not address all servicing and collection of debt. Instead, it is limited in scope to defaulted consumer debt, and in most cases, it is limited to what the collection industry would call third-party collection, which is collection by a party other than the party that originated or holds the debt, essentially as a service provider to the current holder. Currently, the FTCPA imposes certain disclosure requirements, such as debt validation notices that substantiated debt, many Miranda notices that inform the consumer about the nature of the communication. It restricts the time and manner of communications and limits third-party communications. And it prohibits or restricts various specific collection-related activities that are deemed to be deceptive, unfair, or abusive. The UDEP authority of federal regulators, including the CSPB and the FTC, is also a source for debt collection restrictions particularly given that many of the FDCPA's restrictions are already framed in that statute as UDAP. UDAP-based restrictions may apply to the servicing of performing loans or early-stage delinquencies rather than just defaulted debt. They may also apply to creditors or other parties servicing or collecting debt they own. In general, the principles underlying the FDCPA's requirements may form the basis of a UDAP claim so one would not normally expect courts or regulators to impose each specific disclosure or practice requirement in the specific form, format, content that it exists in the FDCPA in the same manner as those requirements apply to entities that are actually debt collectors engaged in debt collection as defined by the FDCPA. Essentially, where the FDCPA imposes rules-based requirements, UDAP requirements are imposed as standards-based requirements. Beyond the FDCPA and UDAP standards, collection-related requirements may arise under other federal laws, including the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, the Service Members Civil Relief Act, and the Military Lending Act with respect to service members, and U.S. bankruptcy, bankruptcy laws. Other than to lay out certain COVID-19 emergency responses, we will not discuss this broader set of laws much on this call as there have not really been developments during the COVID-19 emergency that suggest systemic change going forward on these issues. Nevertheless, understanding those, their requirements is an important part of building a compliant collection program. In addition to the existing set of requirements, it's important to understand the pre-COVID state of certain proposals to change FDCPA or UDAP requirements relating to collection. 
The CACB is currently considering promulgating regulations to further implement certain aspects of the FDCPA, including imposing additional requirements as to the content and manner of delivery of required collection notices, additional restrictions on the time, manner, and frequency of consumer communication, and specific limitations relating to time-barred debt, debt of a deceased consumer, credit reporting for debt in collection, and the subsequent transfer of bad debt uh, to additional holders. The CFTB's proposal, which was issued in May 2019, is essentially a pared-down version of regulations under consideration by the Obama-era CFPB. And proposals that have been advanced recently by House Democrats arguably shed some light on certain elements of the Obama-era rules that are still key elements of Democrats' debt collection wish list. In particular, while regulatory proposals are not currently moving on the issue, the Obama-era CFPB also considered using UDAP rulemaking authority to extend specific FDCPA-like disclosure and practice requirements to the first party servicing and collection. While that effort would not have imposed the exact same set of obligations on first and third party collectors in every case, it would have moved the regulation of first party collection somewhat from a standards-based approach grounded in general UDAP principles to a rules-based approach grounded in specific codified regulations. With the background of the COVID-19 emergency's impact on borrower debt and the current collection regulatory regime laid out, we turn our attention to the more recent proposals pushed largely by House Democrats. Recent proposals affecting the collection of debt can be thought of in two categories. First, there are those proposals designed to limit payment obligations or shield obligors from certain adverse consequences of working with existing creditors to manage COVID-19 related hardships, or on the other hand, defaulting on existing debt. Earlier this year, the CARES Act included several provisions of this nature, including offering a right to forbearance in connection with certain federally related mortgage loans, eviction protection for tenants in federally related properties, and credit reporting protection for account modifications occurring as a result of COVID-19 related hardships. The HEROES Act presents additional protections reflective of a democratic wish list, speaking at least to COVID-19 emergency relief and possibly to broader systemic changes in the way debt collection is conducted and regulated at the federal level. The act would expand foreclosure and eviction protection by eliminating the prior federal government touch points previously necessary for protections to apply. It would also prohibit repossession or other enforcement of security interests. In each case, these protections would apply for 12 months following enactment of the HEROES Act or any act in which, it were, in which the provisions were included. A second category of proposals would target the core federal debt collection regulatory regime itself. And while framed as emergency relief efforts, contain a, a complex mix of true emergency measures and expansions of regulatory scope that have been under consideration for some time and may preview broader systemic reform efforts in the future. The core set of changes in this second category are expansions of the FDCPA to address COVID-19 related delinquencies and defaults. The proposals would apply during the declared COVID-19 emergency and for 120 days after to debt arising from credit and non-credit sources other than mortgage loans that pre-existed enactment of the HEROES Act or again, any act in which these provisions later find themselves. They would prohibit a variety of otherwise lawful means of collecting debt, including, as a non-comprehensive list, enforcing security interest through repossession, limitation of use, or foreclosure, collecting debt through garnishment or similar means, or commencing eviction. They would also require debt collectors to provide specific repayment periods to obligors for any debt that remain past due after the expiration of that 120-day covered period after the end of the COVID-19 emergency. The net result of which is that obligors may be entitled to months or even years of additional repayment time. The specific repayment time would vary based on the nature of the debt, uh, for closed end credit that has defined repayment periods, it would be uh, one additional payment cycle for every payment cycle that was missed during the covered period. Open end credit would be subject to existing uh, requirements related to repayment that are built into the CARD Act, 
uh, and other credit would be subject to repayment periods that would be tiered based on balance and potentially extend for years after uh, the end of the covered period. These more severe restrictions on collection and impositions on debt collectors are likely reasonable to think of as pure emergency response measures that do not necessarily signal broader systemic objectives. Certain scope expansions in the HEROES Act uh, treatment of the FDCPA, on the other hand, may well reflect interest in expanding the federal debt collection regulatory regime beyond the COVID-19 response, even if the HEROES Act does not do so yet. These scope changes include the HEROES Act FDCPA amendment apply to a broader range of debt and debt collectors than does the current FDCPA. The HEROES Act would impose its restrictions not only on consumer debt, but also small business and nonprofit organization debt, and not only on third-party collectors, but also to creditors and first-party collectors. These types of expansions may be worth following as we move into a new normal after the immediate COVID-19 response, and congressional Democrats in particular assess how the regulatory state is working to protect the interests of consumers and small businesses that are likely to be deeper in debt than they would be uh, under typical economic circumstances. With that said about the federal regulatory regime, I'll hand the discussion over to Anjali, who will discuss state development. Thanks, Eric. So in addition to the federal proposals, we have seen a number of state legislative or regulatory measures designed to temporarily restrict certain debt collection practices in the face of the pandemic. As you know, states have existing restrictions on debt collection that either mirror or go beyond federal restrictions. In particular, many states restrict communications with debtors, including explicit restrictions on the volume and nature of those communications. In light of the pandemic, state actions have ranged from explicit restrictions on most communications with debtors to gentle reminders about the challenges borrowers may face in the pandemic to more active encouragement of outreach to borrowers who may be struggling. These state actions have created a number of challenges for servicers given the variability in what is allowed across the different jurisdictions. A few themes have emerged from these varying state actions. First, we've seen a large number of restrictions on outbound communications with debtors. Nevada, Massachusetts, and Washington, D.C. in particular have limited most outbound communications unless they've been initiated by the debtor. Nevada initially implemented an emergency directive deeming collection agencies, quote, non-essential businesses, which effectively prohibited debt collection activities through May 15th of 2020. This included collection activities, whether or not they were in person, and regardless of whether the collection activities could be conducted in compliance with the, quote, essential business limitations by, for example, involving calls, emails, or letters initiated from a collection agency's employee working from home or as part of an ongoing automated script. Massachusetts, on the other hand, which already had in place some of the most restrictive laws on debt collection communications, has further restricted all phone communications to debtors, but not emails or text messages. DC's proposals, which are nearly identical to Massachusetts, took that one step further and restricted all written or electronic communications with borrowers. The Massachusetts emergency regulations were challenged in court, and among other things, the Massachusetts Attorney General is now enjoined from enforcing the restriction on phone communications. In that case, the court found that debt collection outbound calls are commercial speech and thus protected by the First Amendment. The court also found the regulations are redundant of existing state and federal law, such as the FDCPA, and does not, quote, add anything to consumers' protections that existing comprehensive scheme of law and regulation already affords to debtors other than an unconstitutional ban on one form of communication, end quote. Separately, the Massachusetts legislature has been considering proposed legislation that would, among other things, restrict communications with any consumer or any member of their household to collect a debt other than in writing. On the other end of the spectrum, Wisconsin took a different approach, and they've discouraged excessive what they determined to be futile debt collection communications under the theory that consumers should be focused on addressing pandemic-related phone calls and other communications, and that such debt collection communications would distract from those more important messages. On yet the other end of the spectrum, Illinois issued guidance 
guidance encouraging servicers and debt collectors to work with borrowers and even increase communications in order to offer repayment options. Although these different communications-related restrictions are fairly pandemic-specific, consumer advocates have long been pushing for more regulations on what they view as excessive communication to debtors. The varying approaches to communications during the pandemic is indicative of, it, of the different views on the utility of outbound communications on actually collecting debt. As Eric mentioned, the CFPB is considering proposed regulations with respect to, among other things, communications with debtors. And recent pandemic-related actions may be indicative of how those proposals may go in the future. However, that ruling in Massachusetts may also signal how future proposals could be challenged. The second theme of various state restrictions on debt collection practices in the face of the pandemic is around foreclosure and repossession protections. States have been very active in this space and so have um, local governments and have been implementing protections beyond those contained in the CARES Act. This includes moratoria on foreclosures and repossessions of real and personal property. Similar to the restrictions on communications, these moratoria are on a spectrum, from regulators encouraging servicers to cease the activities to outright bans on foreclosures and repossessions for a set period of time. Foreclosure moratoria are common in the face of major national emergencies. We saw that with Hurricane Maria a few years ago. And although we wouldn't expect these types of protections to extend well past the actual emergency, we could see a few issues as a result. One is the potential impact of a flood of filings after the moratoria end, which could have an impact on the court system, consumers, and investors. And the second is enforcement um, activity by federal and state regulators where the moratoria weren't properly implemented. It remains to be seen how, much, how many of these issues we actually encounter given the way the court systems have also been restricted in their activities during the pandemic. The final sort of bucket of restrictions that we've seen come from states are other practice-related uh, restrictions. A number of states have implemented measures preventing debt collectors from garnishing or seizing wages or other payments during the pandemic, including restrictions on garnishing borrowers' CARES Act stimulus payments. States have also implemented moratoria on utility shutoffs. Many states have encouraged institutions to waive fees, such as late fees, of sufficient funds fees and early withdrawal fees during the pandemic and for a period thereafter. So these are some of the themes that we've seen from states uh, to accompany what the federal government has done. I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Deb, for her perspective on what all these actions may mean for the future of debt collection regulation, enforcement, and litigation. Thank you, Anjali and Eric, for the helpful information that you've provided so far today. So as Anjali said, I will talk briefly about the future of debt collection regulation enforcement and litigation. As with the economic downturn starting in the 2008 and 2009 time period, the path ahead will be a difficult one for many consumers and the financial services industry. Debt collection is a necessary part of life, as we all know, but companies attempting to collect debt will need to navigate a myriad of local, state, and federal restrictions to be sure that it is appropriate to do so. The question is, do we face a debt collection ice age ahead? On the regulatory side, as Eric indicated, we expect debt collection regulation will continue, not just during the COVID emergency, but for at least some time after the market works its way through the debt that accumulates during the pandemic. It is hard to predict exactly what measures will be implemented. Certainly, as we near the election in November of this year, we can expect to see continued bold statements from politicians about how to help the American people through this crisis and repayment of debt. Notably, there could be a change in the administration, which would have an effect on debt collection and related issues as agency leadership could change. The Democrats, as we have seen from proposed legislation described during today's call, will have aggressive platforms to limit debt collection in as many areas as possible along the lines that Eric discussed. On the state and local side, debt collectors are accustomed to navigating state and sometimes local issues. However, the landscape is changing so quickly, it is difficult to keep up with each new rule, order, and ordinance. State and local officials, such as attorneys general, governors, mayors, and others, 
will continue to issue rules, ordinances, and orders related to how and when debts can be collected following the extended period of staying these obligations. Moreover, it is important for debt collectors to be apprised of the pandemic status in states and local areas. Is a state or local area in lockdown status? This changes almost daily, and it is important to keep a watchful eye over this landscape. On the enforcement side, going forward, there are certainly risks. These risks fall into many camps. For example, there are UDAP risks with respect to the debt collection. For example, how clear were you in setting up your forbearance plans, your debt collection stays, and other related programs? How clear was your communication? Is or was there a harm to consumers from your debt collection programs and practices? For example, if borrowers experience financial hardship due to the coronavirus pandemic, they have a right to request and obtain a forbearance on their federally backed mortgage for up to 180 days. How does a servicer track those requests and what was agreed to by the parties? And then how does a servicer move forward with debt collection? If there's an adverse effect on consumers, the regulators will be keep keeping a watchful eye over this process. Debt collection firms also face the question of when to resume things like repossession. All credit products may be at issue. The housing market may well experience pronounced but temporary weaknesses as well. Repossessing in the current market may be hard to defend to the regulators. They'll want to know what you did along the way to help the consumers. To get a sense for what's possible in the future here, it is important to learn from the past as well. This will inform both regulatory and litigation risks in the debt collection space. For example, if you look at the Home Affordable Modification Program, which was implemented in 2009 to help mortgage borrowers receive loan modifications, there was a lot to be learned. The program was announced with little notice to servicers in the industry. This resulted in a whole host of issues ranging from lack of guidance as to staffing, training, and compliance, inadequate customer service capacity and increased call volume, miscommunication between borrowers and servicers, ambiguous contracts, and credit reporting issues. All of this then resulted in certain consent orders with the regulators, fines, payments, and government oversight. It also resulted in litigation many cases of which are still pending today in courts across the country with claims ranging from breach of contract, unfair and deceptive business practices, fair court credit reporting issues, negligence, and a laundry list of other creative theories invented by plaintiff's attorneys. The same situation could result today from the CARES Act and other debt collection measures and legislation. So we do have lack of guidance from the government as to the CARES Act at the moment, although the guidance continues to roll out from the various agencies. Will there be miscommunication between borrowers and servicers about when to repay certain obligations? It is likely. Will there be certain ambiguous contracts? That could be likely as well. Will borrowers have a clear understanding of what happens after forbearance or other debt collection stays? That is a potential. And will there be credit reporting issues that could be possible as well? In addition to the mortgage context, we expect to see actions related to loans or lines of credit that may involve breach of contract and unfair and deceptive trade practices claims, as well as credit reporting actions under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So overall, additional COVID relief discussions continue to rapidly evolve, and it is not clear what additional consumer protections ultimately will be adopted. The proposals and inactive relief described in today's call would freeze numerous typical debt collection practices, both by severely restricting outreach to borrowers and by limiting the ability of holders of loans to recover unpaid amounts or to take action on unpaid debts for an extended period of time. These restrictions may also require debt collectors and servicers to revise existing borrower communications, such as letters and scripts. Yet in freezing the collection of debt in respect of the pandemic emergency, these efforts may unwittingly freeze the availability of credit. While the HEROES Act contemplates some compensation for losses incurred as a result of limiting debt collection activities, state restrictions do not. Moreover, the House provisions would not necessarily align the amount or timing of receipts with those that would otherwise be achieved through application of normal collection approaches. 
Moreover, while payments received on the back end might compensate holders in part, they may not have satisfied holders' broader commercial requirements tied to the receipt of payments, such as contractual commitments and default provisions triggered upon loan delinquency or default rates exceeding agreed-on limits. Overall, the bills provide insight into the types of FDCPA changes that many in Congress and the states may like to implement over the short or long term, particularly in the event of national emergencies. Thank you to our audience for tuning in today. Three brief reminders. You will receive an email with a link to the recording of today's call, and the recording will also be available as a podcast on your preferred podcast platform. For more information on Mayor Brown's extensive resources in relation to COVID-19, please visit our new website, covid19.mayorbrown.com. Lastly, as mentioned before, if you have any questions related to today's content, please email them to g, f as in Frank, m as in Mary, at mayorbrown.com. Thank you again for your participation. You may all now disconnect.